Thanks, Kent. Whoa. Good morning, church. How are we doing today? I'm so proud of you guys and the way that we've been responding to one another, for the way that we've striven in the midst of difficult times to be there for one another, to reach out to one another, to call and care for one another. Uh, this is a church where there's more love per square inch than anywhere else I know. And I believe that Christ is pleased to see the way that we care for one another. Some great things have happened this week. There's been many things to celebrate in the midst of the challenges that we've gone through. Jeff's mentioned all of our college students that graduated. Uh, our high school seniors announced their decision on where they might go to college next year. But there was something that happened yesterday that I thought was just really spectacular. It was a reveal. And before James and Whitney reveal what camp's theme is for this summer, they decided they had something else to reveal. And many of you don't know, but the person behind the camera each Sunday that's been helping us with uh, these worship times is James Lane. And so I told him there was a scripture passage in 1 Peter we'll look at in just a moment that says, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have within you. And that's not necessarily what I'm about to ask James to do, but James, if you'll be making your way up here from behind the camera, I thought you might want to reveal to our whole church family a little bit of the news you shared yesterday. So I'll social distance and you step in. There you go. You're good. See your, no, keep moving. To, there you go. Uh, Whitney and I are excited to say that we will be having what I'm only sure will be a beautiful little girl in September. And we're just really excited to share that news. That's awesome. Okay. Stand right there. Yeah. Turn that way. Turn that way. Okay. Let's pray. No, this way. There we go. Okay. Lord, thank you so much for good news. Thank you so much for James and Whitney and what they mean to our church. Thank you for uh, the reveal yesterday and the opportunity to celebrate uh, the good things that you're doing all among us. And Lord, we pray for James and for Whitney. We pray that you would bless Whitney with great health and that you would draw them together as a family. And Lord, we have great expectation about the things that will happen in the future. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would anoint them and protect them through this journey. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, James. And uh, more news tonight, right? Yes. Okay, so tune in tonight, youth, and you'll hear more about uh, what's going on at camp. But I wanted to uh, talk to you today about steadfast hope. Steadfast hope. And I want to remind you of the passage that we've been using uh, quite a bit in this series from James chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. That's what we're doing right now. Because you know that in the testing of your faith, it produces perseverance. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And so we find ourselves on a regular basis thinking about in the midst of our challenges, this need to be steadfast. And I think I've said to you over and over again that in the midst of trials and difficult times, it's very, very critical that we be people who are steadfast. Remember, like a runner, the farther you go in a marathon, the more important it is to stay disciplined, to stay in your routine, to keep doing the things that are important to your success. And so one of the things I've challenged you to do each day is to wake up and before you even get out of bed to pray, my heart is steadfast, oh God, my heart is steadfast. And I want us to be those kinds of people that are praying that kind of prayer because steadfastness is so critical to us always, but in the midst of a trial, especially. Uh, you might remember what the word steadfast means. It means unwavering. It means firm to purpose. It means highly resolved. And as we think about what it means to have steadfast hope this morning, I wanted to make Denny Lloyd happy at home. And so uh, I've brought in Emily Dickinson to talk a little bit about hope. And Denny was the one that pointed out to me that she really loves to use dashes in her poems as well. So listen to this poem with me. It's called Hope. It's the thing with feathers. 
It says, Hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. Hope is that thing with feathers. And what's interesting is long before we find Emily Dickinson talking about hope as something with feathers, we can think back to the great prophet Isaiah, the prophet of the exile, the one who watched as Israel was taken into captivity, dealt with the destruction of Jerusalem and the crumbling of the temple. And you might remember in Isaiah chapter 40 that he has something to say about hope as well. He says, even youths grow weary and grow tired, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and they won't grow faint. There's something important for us to understand steadfastness and hope. And it's what allows us to soar above our circumstances. It allows us to see things from a greater perspective, from the perspective of eternity and from the viewpoint of God. Because that's what wisdom is, is seeing things the way God sees them and responding accordingly. So the challenge for us is to ask, how can we have hope in the midst of our own hopeless situation? And let's be honest, our situation is hopeless without God. And so our hope is not in ourselves. You see, that's the challenge that our culture is going through right now. Some are thinking we can put our hope in our president, our hope in our governor, our hope in the CDC, our hope in the WHO, our hope in the economic recovery, our hope in the CARES Act, our hope. And none of these will provide us with true hope. What we discover as followers of God is that the only hope that we really have is the hope in the promises and the trustworthiness of God. I want us to think about what it is and the great benefit that we have to live on the other side of the resurrection, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But for just a moment, I want you to venture back to the other side of the story, the story of Jesus before Jesus, the story of the Old Testament. And I want to remind you that in the midst of Israel was Jerusalem and a temple. And this temple had a holy place. And if you were allowed to go inside the temple, inside the holy place, it would look something like this. You'd see a, a, a part to the right where people would, uh, priests would work and they would worship and they would uh, offer, sac uh, offer incense and things like that. But only once a year, the high priest was allowed to go to the far left part of the temple. That was called the Holy of Holies. And you can see that there was a great curtain. And he would, one day a year, Yom Kippur, he would go behind the curtain and he would offer the blood of a bull. And as he would offer the blood of the bull, he would pray that God would excuse the sins of his people. That God would take their sins and push them forward and push them forward another year. But he had to think, how in the world could the blood of a bull actually suffice for the sin of himself and for the sin of a whole people? And what he knew is that the only hope he had was in the promises of God. That because God said he would do this, he would then indeed do it. And so the hope was that God would push forward what could not be dealt with any other way. And so what we celebrate when we think about Easter and we think about the great earthquake that happened while Jesus was on the cross is that the curtain was torn in two. The curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple 
was torn asunder from top to bottom. It was as if God was saying, OK, because of Jesus, what you've known was only pushing things forward for another year. Now the way has been opened for us to be in relationship again, to be in community again. And I want us to think about that and I want us to think about it in this way. Hope is realizing that God provides a way when there is no way. Can you say that with me wherever you are today? God provides a way when there is no way. Think about God in that way. That's what our hope is saying. It's saying that even when we can't see a way, God provides a way when there is no way. Let's pray and I'll run you through a few thoughts about hope and what it looks like to have steadfast hope. Heavenly Father, we pray that you might give us a steadfastness, an unwavering confidence in you, no matter what. And we ask that you would remind us that you have promised a way when there is no way. So our only hope is in you. And we ask that we might live with confidence, knowing that you will provide a way when we can't see one. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our ever-living Savior, teacher, Lord, and friend. Amen. Let's think about hope together for just a moment. First thing I want you to notice about hope is that the Greek word for hope is the word elpis. And what that word means is to anticipate with expectation or confidence. So we're steadfast, we're un unwavering, but we're unwavering as we look into the future with confidence, with expectation, with great anticipation that God is going to do something in the future that we can't see. And so I want us to realize that last week when we talked about steadfast faith, one of the things that we used to define faith was Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Notice what it says in the white box on the side. It says, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain about what we do not see. So faith is having a sure and certain hope in what's about to take place, that God will find a way when there is no way. God is our sure and certain hope in the midst of whatever is challenging us today. And so I want us to think about hope and I want to remind you of some things I've told you a couple of years ago. First of all, I want you to remember that hope is our attitude. Every day we wake up and I hope you're saying, my heart is steadfast, oh God, my heart is steadfast. But when we get out of bed, we're walking a tightrope between hope and despair, between choosing to go one direction and choosing to go another. It is our attitude and the way we choose to look at the things that are happening all around us that determine whether or not we will choose hope or despair. We will choose hope or anxiety and worry and fear. And so it's very important for us to see hope as our attitude. Notice uh, Job. We seem to be keep coming to Job as we talk about trials. But you might remember that Job lost everything he had in a day. And in the midst of that, he was walking that type rope, despair or hope. And then he had these friends that weren't very good friends at all. Do you remember what his friends told him? Curse God and die. Just give up. Your situation is hopeless. And you might remember what Job said. He said, though he slay me, I will hope in him and I will argue my ways to his face. Job was saying, I don't know where else to turn. I have nowhere else to go but to put my hope in God, even in the midst of these challenges. Two weeks ago when I was talking to you about steadfastness, I reminded you of Jeremiah. I reminded you that he sat on the Mount of Olives and he watched as the temple was ransacked and as it was set on fire and 
things were burned and it was plundered. And he said, this one thing I bring to mind and because of it, I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. He's faithful. And so what we discover is that every day we wake up and we decide about our attitude. Will we have hope or will we have despair? Will we find God in our present and see him in our future or will we despair instead? That's why Paul would say to the church in Rome in the midst of great persecution and trial, he would say to them these words from Romans 12, verse 12, be joyful in hope, be patient in affliction and be faithful in prayer. It's our choice to be joyful in hope. Hope is our attitude. The second thing I want you to write down is hope is not only our attitude, but hope is our answer. As I mentioned when talking about James a minute ago, James, the James Lane behind the camera, that in 1 Peter chapter 3, we read these words, in your heart, revere Christ as Lord and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. And notice the rest of this. He doesn't say always be ready to give an answer for the nature of the Trinity or the doctrine of the two natures of Christ or some other complicated theological teaching. Notice what he says. Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you for the reason that you have hope. And do it with gentleness and respect. Peter says, in the midst of trials, and 1 Peter was written to a church that was being persecuted. He said, in the midst of the trials that you're going through, always be ready to tell people, this is why I have hope. This is why I see things differently than you do. And so not only is hope our attitude, but then to the culture around us, to our neighbors, to our friends, to our family, Hope is our attitude that becomes our answer. It becomes the reason why we can see things differently. We know the next chapter and we know how the story ends. And because of that, we have hope. And so I want to ask you this question. The question is, how is hope your answer to others? You know, one day a person was asked, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And I heard that the same question was once asked to a little girl, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And she said, well, I'm not sure I know what an optimist and a pessimist are. And so the person said, well, what do you think an optimist and a pessimist is? And she said, well, I think an optimist is somebody who works on your eyes and a pessimist is somebody who works on your feet. And there may be more truth to that than we realize. But you know, an optimist is somebody who sees the world as rosy as it can possibly be. And a pessimist is, see, is somebody who sees the world as negatively as it could possibly be, except for themselves. And if you are trying to decide, am I an optimist or a pessimist? I really love what a guy named Henry Newbegin said when he was asked that question. He was asked, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And he said, I don't know that I am either, but this I do know. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Hallelujah. And that became his answer. And so what we discover about our hope is that it's our attitude, it's our answer, and number three, hope is our anchor. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both what? Sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. 
let's understand that text within its greater context. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 18. It says, God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie. The two unchangeable things are the nature of God and the fact that God cannot tell anything that isn't true. Because of those two things, we who have fled to take hold of hope that's been set before us must be greatly encouraged. Of all the people on the earth, we should have hope because our confidence is in a God who cannot tell a lie and doesn't change. And because of this, verse 19, we have this hope as an anchor, an anchor that holds us in place in our souls, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Do you remember how the high priest once a year would go behind the curtain and he would sprinkle blood, but he knew he wasn't in any way certain that the blood of a bull or a goat could substitute for the sins of mankind. And so his hope was in the promise of God that God would do what he said. And in Jesus we see God has done what he said. And that the way has been opened up for us so that we might go behind the curtain into a relationship with God, not once a year, but every day. And we can have this hope of living in relationship with God now, now and into the future because of the sure and certain hope we have. In thinking about this passage this week, I wondered what it was like the day the earthquake came. Can you picture yourself? You're a priest in the temple of God and Jesus is crucified just less than a mile away. And as Jerusalem shakes, the curtain is torn in two. And I wondered, would you dare go inside? Would you dare to set foot beyond the curtain in that place where only the high priest was allowed to go and once a year carrying the blood of a bull with him? Would you dare to walk through there? The writer of Hebrews says, oh, you can. You can because your hope is anchored there. Jesus made the way for you to be right with God and for God to say, I'm right with you. And if anything can't give us hope, that should. You're right with God because of Jesus. And in that, we have hope. And so we have this hope as our attitude. We have it as our answer. We have it as our anchor. And so this morning, I challenge you to wear hope as your helmet. Notice what it says in 1 Thessalonians. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as the breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. And so we put on hope as a helmet. And what does a helmet do? It protects our mind. It keeps our attitude right. It protects our mouth. It allows our answers to be true. It gives us a perspective. And so we can see that we have steadfastness and confidence. Hope. It's our answer. It's our attitude. It's our anchor. It's the assurance of our salvation. And so, brothers and sisters, no matter what's going on, Paul says this, don't be uninformed about those who fall asleep and don't grieve like the rest of mankind that doesn't have hope. For what we believe is this, that Jesus died and that he rose and that we believe he will bring with him all those who have fallen asleep. Jesus has risen from the dead. Hallelujah. And so as we live in these in-between times and we live with hope and we look forward with hope, Paul tells us that in the midst of our hope, God does something amazing for us. Look what he says in Romans chapter 5. 
we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character produces hope. Now look with me in verse five. And if you don't mind, just read it with me. Look what it says. And hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The reason that your hope is such an attitude, is such an answer, is such an anchor is because God has taken his love and through the Holy Spirit, he has poured it into you so that you know in the midst of whatever you're going through today that God loves me. And with God's sure and certain hope that he will keep his promises because his nature never changes. And with the love of God poured into our heart, we look forward with hope, believing and knowing that we can be joyful in hope. We can be patient in affliction. We can be faithful in prayer. And we can wear this helmet as our attitude, our answer, our anchor. And we can wear it with confidence that the sure and certain hope of God is ours. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that you would give us a steadfast hope, a sure and certain faith that you will keep your promises. Lord, we thank you that the way's been made open for us. And Lord, what we confess this day is that we know the way has been open, but we haven't been bold about walking into a deeper relationship with you. And so we ask this week with steadfast hearts that you would draw us closer to you, that you would pour your love into our hearts and that you would help us to be joyful in hope. We pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus, risen from the dead. Hallelujah and amen.